So a few weeks back, I introduced a concept called the emergence diet based on what grizzly bears do as they're coming out of hibernation and coming out of torpor. And that's a pretty high protein diet. Last week's video talked about protein and branch chain amino acids and how there's some conflicting evidence about the effects of branch chain amino acids and specifically that high levels of circulating branch chain amino acids are associated with insulin resistance in humans. I put up this study that showed that mice that were fattened on a Western style diet, if you put them onto a diet that was limited in branch chain amino acids, very low in uh, protein in general or branch chain amino acids specifically, that they would rapidly lose fat mass. And furthermore, I said that there are supplements that you can use, such as alpha ketoglutarate, which I've been selling at fireinabottle.net slash shop. If you want to help out uh, my video series and get your branch chain amino acids down, that will help you to break down uh, valine, isoleucine, and leucine, the branch chain amino acids. But I got a lot of questions from people saying, well, why don't we just eat a very low branch chain amino acid diet. And so I thought we should look into that, right? And so the video about the emergence diet, I'm talking about what the bears are doing uh, in this early part of the season, April, May, and June, as they are going from a torpid state to a, a very active metabolic state, their leanest and most active part of the year. But in this video, we're gonna talk about how do the bears get to that early part of emergence in the first place? Uh, first, there's a pre-emergence process before you get to emergence. And I suspect that all of us are at different points in this calendar. And so what is going to work for some people, um, as I said in the previous video, eating a high protein diet, protein is very thermogenic and that might work really well for some people. Other people, if you're more insulin resistant, you might be further behind on this calendar and you may have to start with the pre-emergence diet. And that is what we're going to talk about in this video. So in looking at these studies and this data, one thing that I thought is that in the winter, of course, during pre-emergence, bears are, of course, fasting, right? Hibernating animals are not eating anything. And so, so if we're arguing that obesity is a form of mammalian torpor, animals would, of course, fast for six months in advance of emerging from torpor. But of course, that's not always practical in actual walking around humans with day jobs, etc. But perhaps we can mimic that hibernation period where the bears are not consuming any food simply by restricting protein or restricting specific amino acids. Furthermore, perhaps once you have, once you've done this to a certain extent of time and lost a lot of the fat mass, perhaps then you can eat that post-emergent high protein diet and have that protein be thermogenic for you. The last video I talked a lot about the effects of branch chain amino acids and their effect on insulin resistance. But when I was thinking about this idea of restricting protein and restricting amino acids, it occurred to me that one of the main things that activates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor is a compound called kinurinine, which is actually made from tryptophan, which is yet another amino acid. And so I looked and sure enough, someone had tested in rats. This is a tryptophan restricted diet you can see these uh squares or diamonds here uh this is the lowest tryptophan in the diet all of these rats are on a high fat diet that would typically fatten up rodents and you see this nice dose response as tryptophan goes lower so does weight gain in the rats and so uh, in addition to the three branching amino acids a low protein diet might help to reduce aryl hydrocarbon receptor activation. If you followed my video series, you'll know that that's a big deal. So this is one more look at branch chain amino acids in humans and their association between uh, level between fatness and between dietary levels. And so this shows the association between circulating branch chain amino acids and the weight uh, in humans. And so you can see as uh, branch chain amino acids go up, weight goes up. And the same thing is true of fat mass. Uh, this is body fatness uh, is clearly correlated with branching amino acids in circulation. And this is diet. And so diet is not as strongly correlated, but the more protein that people eat, in fact, you see higher levels of circulating branching amino acids. And so there's probably a combination effect happening here between if you're torpid, then you're not as good at breaking down those branching amino acids, but then also the more protein you eat, the more branching amino acids that there are to break down. But there is some good data about branch chain amino acid restriction in humans. In this study, it says, we demonstrate in a randomized controlled trial that a moderate protein restriction diet also improves markers of metabolic health in humans. 
So in this diet, they, they gave people a seven to 9% protein diet for 43 days. So these people were not asked to restrict calories. This was not a calorie restricted diet. Um, and you can see in the protein restricted diet over here on the left, they actually lost about 2.6 kilograms, which is about six pounds of weight. And, uh, about three pounds of that was fat mass. So they did lose some lean mass, but they also lost significant fat mass. And that's interesting. And, and in most studies where you see significant weight loss, obese humans have more lean mass as well as, uh, more fat mass. And so you often see some loss of lean mass as well, but this is, but this loss of six pounds in weight over 43 days without caloric restriction with just restricting, uh, protein is encouraging and the people on the controls did not lose any weight and the people with the restricted protein, you see this drop in fasting blood glucose. So that shows you they're becoming more insulin sensitive, uh, which is very interesting. This thing called FGF 21 goes from baseline, uh, 130 to at, to after the protein restriction to 260. So that's a doubling. This is the increase in FGF 21. It doubles. That's a huge finding. FGF 21 is released by the liver. It's thermogenic. It promotes metabolic rate. This is a very interesting finding. And you can see that in fact, in the humans that reduced their, their protein intake, it did indeed reduce their circulating branch chain amino acids. So it did the thing that it was supposed to do in addition to causing the insulin sensitivity and the increased FGF 21. Um, and you can see this was the dietary changes in the protein restricted group. So their energy, they actually ate more calories. They increased their calories by 235 uh, calories per day as they were losing weight. So you see more calories, less fatter. So that's interesting. Um, protein uh, consumption obviously drops. That's the point of the experiment, right? It went from 111 grams per day down to 64. And so that's, that's a pretty significant drop in protein. And as a percentage of energy, it went down by 9%. Carbohydrates went up by 18% of energy and fat went down by 7% of energy. So in this diet, uh, they consume more calories and they replace both protein and fat with carbohydrates. This is another study in humans. It's a much shorter term diet, but it's a much more aggressive reduction in branched chain amino acids. And so in the average American diet, we get about 2.8% branched chain amino acids. In this study, they reduced them by 75%. So they went all the way from 2.8 down to 0.7% branched chain amino acids. And you can see that as a result of this, so this is only one week, but you see these uh, circulating concentrations go from about maybe 430 uh, and in the massively branching amino acid reduced group, they go all the way down to 200. So they see a 50% reduction in circulating branched chain amino acids with very severe protein restriction. Uh, in, in that previous study, they also saw those reduction of branched chain amino acids, but this red line here, that's about where they went from. They, in that study, they went from four, uh, 430 down to like 370. So that's a drop, but nothing near 50%. But with this 75% reduction, that's where you saw the 50% reduction in branched chain amino acids. So that's very interesting. Um, and they did see, this is a short-term study. So these results are not statistically significant, but they did see a small drop in blood glucose, uh, fasting blood glucose, as well as a drop in insulin. And that suggests that the people were becoming much more insulin sensitive uh, in just one week of branched chain amino acid restriction. Now to get branched chain amino acids down to 1% of your diet or less, they were 0.7%, you have to get all the way down to 5% protein or less, which sounds probably crazy to a lot of people. And you're wondering, is this safe and practical? And so if you think about that diet where they're substituting starch for protein and fat, you think, okay, well, I'll just eat white rice maybe, but that is actually not going to work because even white rice is 7.4% protein. And you can see a lot of other quote unquote starches like potatoes are almost 11% protein as a percent of calories is what this table is. Um, oats are all the way up at 13% protein, all purpose flours at 11%. And so the current U.S. diet is about 16% protein as a reference point. This is from the an article from the 1939 USDA Yearbook of Agriculture, where they looked at present-day diets. 
And so you can see here, uh, in 1939, the USDA reported, and I just picked one of these bars at random. This is slightly above the median. Um, and so they were had 3,800 calories per day. This is an adult men, and about 90 grams of protein. So that's only about 9.5% protein. So that suggests that the traditional American diet is actually closer to that quote-unquote protein-restricted diet we saw in that first experiment than to modern diets. Uh, remember, this is back before refrigeration was common. Something like a, a you know a skinless chicken breast wasn't necessarily in everyone's fridge, right? And so, and this is uh, in black cities in the South, and that diet was even down at eight percent protein back in 1939. And so, when we start to look at this protein restriction, we're actually not so far out of the tr historical U.S. diet. And when you think about the U.S. diet. Back in the day, it was based on carbohydrates, uh, white flour, potatoes, sugar, cornmeal, um, fats, buttercream and lard, and some dairy. And the dairy was the main source of protein because, like I say, without refrigerators, if you lived in the city, meat was probably more of a luxury than necessarily an everyday thing. And to point that out, I have this cool menu. So this is from 1906 in the Bowery in New York City. This is not a high-end neighborhood this is definitely a working class neighborhood. And so this is a quick lunch restaurant. And so you see average wages in 1906 were only 22 cents per hour. And so at the top of this menu, you see they have a lot of eggs and omelets, but uh, those are 10%, which after taxes, you know, you probably have to do 45 minutes of labor to afford uh, two fried eggs with coffee or tea. And if you want a little bit of ham in that omelet, uh, that's going to go up to 15 cents, which back then was very expensive. And so probably a lot more people would order uh, just simply rolls, butter and coffee, which is obviously a very low protein option. Um, oatmeal and milk is a little higher in, in protein. Um, and then you look down here, wheat cakes with maple syrup. Pancakes are, of course, popular in America. Then you've got your homemade pies of all kinds. Pie is very popular in America. And so I'm guessing these were very popular menu items. But in general, in this menu, you don't see a lot of meat. You do see this uh, this ham roll or a salmon roll. And so I've got this. Um, this was, of course, was uh, an old label for canned salmon. That's probably a little bit of canned salmon you'd get on here. Uh, this is Taylor ham. This is made in New Jersey. This might have been the type of ham that was available because it was made locally and it was preserved a little bit. You didn't necessarily need a, refri a refrigerator for Taylor ham. And these processed meats are very high in fat typically. And so the protein percentage is pretty low. Taylor ham's only about 20% protein as a percent of calories. And so this, this ham on a roll, since it's only three pennies, I'm guessing was a very meager portion of ham. If we look at those items of classic Americana, like griddle cakes, um, this is my estimate. I took a pancake recipe. You start with wheat flour, you add uh, milk and some eggs. And so the protein of the pancakes itself is not that bad, but then you put your butter on the griddle, the pancake absorbs that. Then you serve it with a pad of butter and syrup, and that really uh, sends down the protein ratio. So this is protein, carbs, fat. My guess for most pancakes is probably down to 6% protein and roughly equal split between calories and fat uh, when they're, when they're finally served. This is apple pie. This is straight out of the USDA database from a home, a home recipe for apple pie. You see it's down at 3.6% protein, right? Uh, 56% carbs, 42% fat. And those are right things that are right off of that menu. And so I want to look at a couple other diets around the world. So I've talked before about Thailand. So this study, they looked at Thai rice farmers. And so most, the vast majority of their proteins come from rice. And you can see on this table here, um, this is them, 10.6% uh, of their diet is protein. So that's again, well below, uh, you know, the normal American average now, and it's 84% carbs. And I, the reason I like this study is that these uh, Thai rice farmers have the highest resting metabolic rates of any study that I have ever found. And I've read a lot of metabolic rate studies. These people on this 10% protein diet have absolutely ripping metabolic rates. The same thing is true if you look at the Samani people in Bolivia, they eat uh, plantain and manioc. They have a very starch-based diet and they have just through the roof metabolic rates. But lastly, I wanna look at this Tokelau. So Tokelau is a Pacific island. 
And this is, uh, this is from the paper, the two references for the tie and the Tokelau studies are down here. So this is a description here of the Tokelau diet. It's mostly based on coconut. They also eat uh, quite a bit of taro and breadfruit, especially breadfruit. Breadfruit is a, is a starchy, is a starchy fruit similar to a plantain in, in composition. Uh, they eat a little bit of, uh, you know, cereals. That's probably white flour, sucrose. This is probably imported stuff. Uh, and a little bit of fish. And you can see specifically down here, it's like one and a quarter uh, whole coconuts a day and 400 grams of breadfruit and 230 grams is about eight ounces of fish that I assume is something like a Pacific snapper. And so that diet of Tokelau is interesting. I talk a lot about how the tr the traditional American diet based on butter and flour and potatoes is high in starch and high in saturated fat and actually not terribly high in protein. And so this Tokelau diet ends up being the same way because breadfruit and coconut are both foods that are very low in protein. And you can see those are the two staple foods and they only get about eight ounces of fish per day. Also, you can see the fat composition of all of these coconut things. And so you see this uh, 12 O and 14 O. And so coconuts and so coconut fat is very saturated, but it's made out of shorter chain saturated fats than you'd find in butter or beef or something like that. And so famously, they have what are called medium chain triglycerides, which are things that are like eight and 10 carbons long. And those are a liquid at room temperature. But actually the vast, but that's only about 10% of the coconut. The vast majority of coconut are made out of these two fats called lauric and myristic acid. So I've been calling these medium long chain saturated fats because uh, 16 and 18 are called long chain saturated fats and 10 and 8 are called medium. So what do we have left? Well, medium long chain fats, right? And so that's specifically this lauric and myristic acid you can see makes up close to 70% of coconut fat. And that's what they have in their diet. And this breadfruit and coconut milk is 91% saturated fat with some starch. And this is a very low protein dish indeed. I've got some lists that I'll post uh, in the description. I'll post the links to foods and you can get the percent of branch chain amino acids in, in a serving of those foods as a percent of calories. So look for that down below. In a lot of ways, these some of these tokelau dishes are very similar to traditional American dishes. Like the macros in this dish is very similar to apple pie. And so, and so I just want to think again, so I just want to think for a second about those medium long chain saturated fats. And so you have, so these are all the fats found in coconut oil. And so you have these MCTs, these medium chain triglycerides, which you've, I'm sure you've probably heard about them. They become very trendy. The thing about those is we can't store them. And so our body is forced to burn them more or less immediately. So they get sent to the liver and they either get burned right away, or if we can't burn them right away, they get made into ketones. The liver basically gets overwhelmed with this, uh, with these short chain fats, and so it breaks them down into acetyl CoA, and it makes ketones, and it dumps them. Now, I'm not sure if that's a great thing to do. I know a lot of people like MCT oil. I'm, I'm unconvinced, but MCT oil is only about 10% of coconut oil. Then, on the other hand, uh, you have these long chain. Uh, f saturated fatty acids that 16 O is palmitic acid 18 O is stearic acid and this is what's in butter this is what's more in beef fat or even uh, palm oil and so and the thing about these fats is that uh, stearic acid 18 O is easily desaturated into oleic acid the monounsaturated fat by an enzyme called SCD1 and so stearic acid doesn't really stick around long and if you look at uh, people, if you look at people with obesity, if you look at modern people, we have very low levels of stearic acid, but unfortunately you can't really fix that by just eating stearic acid because they don't get stored. They get converted to SCD1. The whole problem is we have these upregulated enzymes that are making unsaturated fat, making monounsaturated fat. And, and the, the palmitic acid, the same thing happens. It actually gets extended by an elongase. It adds two carbons onto it, and then it becomes stearic acid briefly before getting desaturated again to oleic acid. So when you consume palmitic and stearic acid, really your body is mostly going to convert them to oleic acid. It will store some of the palmitic acid and a little bit of the stearic acid, but a lot of this just gets converted to oleic acid. It doesn't really change anything. The, the medium long chain fatty acids are very interesting 
the the 12 chain fatty acids lauric is very preferentially burned but it can also be stored as is and the same thing is true of myristic acid and the thing about these two fats is that they're not as easily recognized by these enzymes that extend and desaturate the other long chain saturated fats and so these guys are very unique because they're actually the only the only fats that can really displace unsaturated fats in your body tissue and so they looked at the the body fat composition of the toke allowance and you can see so these are people from new zealand of european descent and they're eating presumably more of a traditional european diet and you can see here's uh lauric acid and myristic acid and they only have about four and a half percent of these saturated fats but the toke allowance who have been eating this coconut fat they have 27 percent or almost 28 percent of these of these medium long chain saturated fats because like i say you can store these and they're eating them all the time and so and so they have actually 52 percent saturated fat and this is the highest saturated fat that i've ever seen in a human population the new zealanders only have about 34 percent saturated fat and then if you look at monounsaturated fat what's happening is that lauric acid and the myristic acid is directly replacing oleic acid. The Europeans from New Zealand have almost 50% uh, monounsaturated fat. The toke allowance only have 28% because it is being directly replaced by those medium long chain uh, fats and coconut oil. And furthermore, they only have 3.8% uh, polyunsaturated fat. That's linoleic acid. So, uh, you know, in total... The toke allowance only have 48% unsaturated fat, whereas New Zealanders have had 63% unsaturated fat. And that's a massive difference. And the toke allowance are the only society I've ever seen with fat that's saturated. And everyone who who has visited them described them as being in great health. And, and here they are walking around with the most saturated fat on earth. And it's all because their diet contains large amounts of lauric and myristic acid. So this, I showed this in the emergence diet video, but this is the, the fat of an echidna, which is a spiny anteater who eats mostly ants. And this is, this is pre hibernation. Uh, so they have about a uh, 69% monounsaturated fat before hibernation and they have about 25% saturated fat. Remember that 25% saturated fat cuz we're going to see some humans with the with with that almost that same amount of saturated fat in their fat tissue. And this is after hibernation. And so the echidnas lose a huge amount of this monounsaturated fat. You see saturated fat goes from 25 up to 35. So as they get closer to emergence, monounsaturated fat is decreasing and saturated fat is increasing. And that is the idea of the pre-emergence diet. We're going to try to push our fat stores in the direction that hibernating animals do as they burn off their fat during winter with their long fast, which we're, of course, mimicking with a protein fast. But we're also trying to resaturate, right? So the modern so modern humans don't look like the toke allowance or the New Zealanders. This study was done in 1985 in Toronto, and these are normal people, and they only have 26% saturated fat. Um, PUFA is up a little bit to 14%, but MUFA is also very high at 58%. Uh, their monounsaturated fat to saturated fat ratio is over 2 to 1. That's very high. And these are people in Europe undergoing bariatric surgery for weight loss who are very obese i think their average bmi was around 52 and you can see again saturated fat is down at 25 percent that's the same as the echidnas pre-hibernation and monounsaturated fat is up over 60 percent up to 60.7 percent the monounsaturated fat to saturated fat ratio in this group you can see is well over two to one and so i'm talking about this as if the change in saturated fat actually causes the animals to emerge from hibernation as opposed to it's just something that's correlated with the change in the seasons and one of the reasons i think that is from this very interesting study uh which is done pretty recently um so they took four groups of rats and they gave them different diets and three groups of the rats they actually put on a western diet or a high fat diet and they fattened them up before the trial um, this group in the black, uh, was not 
uh, fattened up first. So these are always on a high carb, low fat diet. So this is the, is called a chow diet and they give it to rodents in the lab and it keeps them lean. And so this is kind of a normal control rat. That's kind of the, the level of weight that you want to see. This group in the blue, these are on a high fat diet. And so uh, in advance of this experiment, these three groups, the red, green, and blue were fattened up on a high fat diet. Right. So these are fat rats. And then at the beginning of the experiment, they switch them onto three different diets. And so this blue is the high fat control. So these were on a high fat diet before they got fat. They continued them on the high fat diet and they continued to gain weight. Now, these mice are very interesting. So these mice in red, they were fattened on a high fat diet, but then they switched back onto the control diet. They switched them back onto the high carb, low fat diet. Despite the fact that this diet keeps these rats lean and keeps generation after generation of rat lean who is maintained on this high carb, low fat diet, once they're metabolically broken, if you try to put them back onto that high starch, high starch diet, it doesn't fix them. They're actually stuck. So even though you put them on this diet that keeps normal rats lean, once they're once they're fat, once they're overweight, once they're torpid, whatever you want to call it, once they're dysregulated, once their enzymes are screwed up, putting them back onto the high carb diet does not fix them. In fact, they continue to get fatter, just like the mice who are kept on the high fat diet. They're stuck. And so what's happening is that they're doing a lot of lipogenesis. Lipogenesis is stimulated by all the monounsaturated fat and the high fat diet that they're given to begin with. Once they eat all that monounsaturated fat, they increase lipogenesis. Lipogenesis creates more oleic acid. It creates more monounsaturated fat. Monounsaturated fat causes more lipogenesis, etc. And so those mice don't get fixed by putting them back on a high starch diet. And the last group, what happened is they replaced the fat in this diet. So this is lard. It's, it's a lot of monounsaturated fat. It's got some corn oil in there. So it's a fair amount of polyunsaturated fat. And they replaced all of that fat with pure lauric acid, trilauric. And so that's pure uh, 12 carbon saturated fat. And that is the fat that will start to replace the monounsaturated fat and the polyunsaturated fat in the body fat of these mice. And over time, those mice, given the lauric acid replacing their unsaturated fat, they returned to the weight of the control mice. So when you resaturate your fat, that is how you lose the weight. Um, and this, and this lauric acid, uh, they didn't test, unfortunately they didn't test the, the change in body fat composition of these mice, but we see in humans, there's pig studies that show that lauric acid and myristic acid will absolutely replace monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat in your stored body fat. And so we can use those medium long chain fats to resaturate. Furthermore, in this study, if you watch my video, how olive oil makes you fat, you'll see that dietary oleic acid, dietary olive oil, monounsaturated fat increases lipogenic enzymes. Well, lauric acid, as it resaturates your fat, does the exact opposite. And so SREB P1C is the master transcription factor of lipogenic enzymes. And you can see here's, here's rats that have been on that low fat control their whole life. They, they were fattened on the high fat diet that's high in monounsaturated fats. Um, these are, are rats that have been on that high fat diet their whole life. And you can see they have three times the level of this, uh, lipogenic transcription factor. But once you put them back onto that lauric acid and you resaturate them, the, the SREB P1C goes right back to control levels. And so if you resaturate them, you can fix them metabolically. Um, these mice NR, right? These were fattened and then put back on the high carb diet they still have nearly twice the levels of this lipogenic enzyme. So you can see what's happening. They are, they are changed metabolically. They have upregulated lipogenic enzymes and they can't get out of that as long as they're full of MUFA, right? And here's the same thing happening. PPAR gamma is another enzyme that if it's upregulated in the liver, that's bad. These ones that uh, were fattened and then put on the, on the high carb diet have even more, uh, PB or gamma than ones who stayed on the high fat diet, but <laughs> the ones who got lauric acid, they're right back to control. So the ones given lauric acid are actually fixed metabolically, unlike the ones that went back onto the high carb diet. Um, this is cert one. If you've watched any of my videos, you know that, uh, 
acetylation is a big deal and cert one is the thing that removes acetyl groups from your mitochondrial enzymes and so you can see the ones given lauric acid have this absolutely this is a nearly eightfold increase in cert one levels and that's huge that means they can get their metabolisms going again if they can activate cert one and finally this is an adipose tissue the ones given the lauric acid this is fatty acid synthase that is the enzyme that makes fat and so we know these we know these rats are not doing lipogenesis in their adipose tissue because they literally don't have any fatty acid synthase like here's one that's a 90% reduction at least maybe more in fatty acid synthase of rats where again they were fattened initially they were broken and then they use lauric acid to resaturate them and now they're not doing lipogenesis anymore and so oleic acid controls lipogenesis and lauric and myristic acid replace the oleic acid um, where can you get these lauric and myristic acids? Well, like I said, coconut oil and also palm kernel oil. You can see that it's capitalized. I really want to emphasize the fact that I'm not talking about palm palm oil. I'm talking about palm kernel oil, not palm oil. They're very different in terms of fat composition. If you want to use this strategy, you have to get palm kernel oil, not palm oil. Uh, you can find palm kernel oil in cheap chocolate substitutes, <laughs> interestingly, among other places. Um, and so I just I just want to think about. It. So now I'm, I'm integrating these two concepts in this pre-emergence diet. Right. And so now we're talking about restricted protein and restricted branch chain amino acids. And we're talking about saturated fat and lauric and myristic acid. And so this was that first um that first menu item in that paper about the toke allowance and you can see so what they would do is they they take breadfruit and they simmer it in uh coconut milk and i had to guess the general proportion of breadfruit and coconut milk but that gives you something that is about three percent protein right that meal is three percent protein and the rest is split between very very saturated fat and starch uh with some sugar in there and so I've actually replicated this uh, at my local supermarket by buying some rice checks and a can of coconut oil. And what I do is I pour the rice checks into the bowl and I just, you know, coconut oil is pretty thick, but I just add it little at a time and I kind of stir it until all the uh, rice checks are, are thoroughly coated. And that gives me something that's about 5% protein um, and about 50% carbs and 40% fat. And so that's my stand in for the toke allowance staple of breadfruit and coconut milk. Um, I was just thinking about other Americana things that have, that are similarly low protein. Uh, one thing is like cream of vegetable soups, like cream of asparagus is only about 6% protein. Um, pasta Alfredo, because it's mostly fat is about 7% protein. And actually you could make pasta Alfredo and leave the cheese out of the cream sauce. And you could get that down to probably 5% protein, no problem. And so uh, you might be worried that uh, consuming a diet this low in protein is bad for you, will cause muscle loss. Um, I don't know exactly how they come up with protein recommendations in humans. But what I know a lot about is how they come up with protein recommendations in pigs. And so one of the emphasis in the pork industry recently has been reducing uh, nitrogenous runoff. And so they found that you can, if you have the right balance of amino acids, you can dramatically lower the amount of protein that you feed to pigs and it lowers the amount of nitrogen runoff. And so you can see this is a normal, uh, this is a pig on a quote unquote normal protein diet. Let's call it a traditional or a classic pig diet because there's not a ton of science behind it, but they give them about 15% protein. This is a diet with much lower protein content, but they've, they've made sure that they got the amino acid balance correct. Um, and so you can see this is what the diet's composed of. I mean, you can see uh, under the normal protein, it's almost 19% soybean meal, which is 47% protein um, as it's as it comes from the factory. And so in this low protein diet, we've gone from 19% soybean meal all the way down to uh, a little over 5% protein meal. And we've replaced it with some corn and some corn starch. And so this diet, it really is uh, pretty dramatically lowered in protein content. And you can see they're using supplemental amino acids to make sure that they have the right amino acid balance. And what happens is these pigs on only 10.2% protein, 
grow essentially just as fast as the pigs on 15% protein. You can see the fat free lean gain. This is the amount of lean mass they gain every day. So that's um, in kilograms. So that's uh, almost a pound. And so uh, one question, and this is this is kind of a side note, but it's a fun one for me. We grow all these soybeans in America and you can see the pigs grew just as fast with less than a third of the soybean meal. Traditional Amer American farming is very set in its ways. They don't like to change. So you can tell them, hey guys, you don't actually need to grow and feed all of those soybeans, right? The reason that we feed all these soybean oil to humans is that we grow all these soybeans to make a uh, soybean meal to feed pigs in the first place. And then the soybean oil is is like a leftover that they have to do something with. And so they, they you know, craft food, markets it, and sells it to, to you and me to eat on our salad, right? But we don't even need all those soybeans in the first place because this diet has less than a third of the amount of soybean meal in it. And the pigs grew just as fast as long as you get the amino acids right. And 50% 50, 50 of our soybeans are exported anyway. And so those pigs that are only getting 10% protein are adding lean mass at a prodigious rate. These are racehorse animals. So in the 25 days of this experiment, the pigs gain 35 pounds. You can see this is in kilograms. This is straight out of the study. I've converted it to pounds here for Americans. And so they've gained 35 pounds overall, but this is fat free lean mass. Uh, they've gained, they gained 21 pounds of fat free lean mass. That's muscle, blood, skin, and bone in only 25 days. And so these racehorse animals that are just packing on protein and skin in a, in a matter that even the fastest growing teenager couldn't even comprehend of even those fast growing pigs only need 10% protein. And so you have to assume that a modern, for a modern human, your protein requirement, if as long as your amino acids are okay, it's got to be way below 10%. Um, you can also see these pigs. So this is the low protein diet. You see what happens is when you feed the pigs the 15% protein, they're just urinating out tons of nitrogen because they're just breaking. They don't need that protein, right? They don't need 15%. Even a pig <laughs> growing at that rate doesn't need 15% protein. And so they're just excreting most of it. And if you drop it down to 10%, well, now they're excreting a lot less. So 15% protein, only 40% of the nitrogen is retained. 60% is just eliminated. And if you go down to 10% protein, now you see they have 60% retention. Um, and so about 6% of their dietary protein is retained. And so that suggests to me that an adult human can probably do fine in that 5 to 6% range. We're not obviously growing like these pigs are. And so I made some lists of percentage of branch chain amino acids and foods uh, to help you guys out. I'll have them posted at the blog fire in a bottle dot net. And I'll put the links uh, in the in the video description down below. Uh, stick with me if it takes me a couple hours to get that up after the video is up. Check back in. I kind of teased this part of this chart before showing that even the starch foods are high in protein. But interestingly, a lot of the tropical starches are not so much. And I don't. Um, I don't know why that is. Uh, there's probably no reason. And I, I, it's tempting to think, oh, the amount of protein in starches is some signal to animals that you're far from the equator. But I don't, I don't, that's probably not true. That's a hard argument to make. I think it's just, uh, I think it's probably just happenstance, but, um, but you can see interestingly, uh, so yeah, potatoes are 11% protein by calories. Plantain is only 3%. Um, cassava is a, is a root that is a really tasty root. Actually, that's only 3%, uh, protein cassava flour is only 1%. And so cassava flour is a very interesting thing. You can use it to bake with. I'll show some pictures of tortillas later. I just want to point out tapioca and cassava come from the same plant. They both come from the cassava plant, but they are very different. If someone says you can bake with cassava flour, they mean cassava flour. They do not mean tapioca. I tried making tortillas with this. It was like rubber. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes. <laughs> Don't get the tapioca flour. Get the cassava flour. Anyway, and, and you can see breadfruit. This is what they were eating in Tokelau. Only 4% protein. And so that, that Tokelauan dish really is low in protein. And as I was saying, here's the cassava flour that I bought. Here's the recipe that I made. So you can see this is combining low protein with high coconut oil. Right. And so I made a cup of flour, a cup of the cassava flour, a quarter cup of coconut oil, 
um, a little baking powder and salt. You add water until it's uh, a decent consistency. I've got a little tortilla press. I just pressed them out. And then I served them with a little bit of cream cheese and then uh, tomato and scallions chopped on them. And they were delightful. And the macros here is only, that's only 2% protein. Um, it's 60% fat. And the majority of that fat is lauric acid and myristic acid. So this is just a simple idea that is sort of maximizing all of the ideas in this video. You do have to be able to cook to make this. If you are unwilling or unable to cook or you just need something convenient, here's some ideas. Uh, bugles chips, not for your health. I think it's just the perfect uh, melt in your mouth, not in your hand consistency, are made from uh, coconut oil and or palm kernel oil. So this is one of the very few things that you can find in a normal convenience store or grocery store that actually is a convenience snack that's low in protein and is made with coconut and or palm kernel oil. Um, these are obviously fancy. This is they're doing it on purpose for your health. But this is an interesting product because these are organic plantain chips. They had them at my local co-op. So they seem to be fairly well distributed. And like I was saying, plantains have very low protein. And actually, um, when you look at the protein composition of plantains, they're actually low in branched chain amino acids, which is also interesting. And so this food right here is probably half of its calories is from coconut oil and half of it is from mostly starch. And I think the branched chain amino acids are down to one quarter of 1%, right? And so I was talking about 1% as a target. Well, this is only one quarter of the target. So uh, that's a good option. And, you know, this is just another example. These are just regular potato chips, but they're made in coconut oil. And you can find these around. Um, I actually couldn't find them in Ithaca, but I'm sure they're distributed. These are more uh, meat, dairy, quote unquote, protein foods, if if you will. Um, so one of the one of the very few proteins that you can find that is actually very low in branch chain amino acids. Most foods, and it doesn't seem to matter much if they're plant or animal sourced. Most foods are about uh, between sixteen and twenty four percent branch chain amino acids. Um, as a percent of the protein. And so more or less branched chain amino acids are pretty much correlated with, with protein levels. And on a national average, it's something like 17 ish percent of our protein is branched chain amino acids. There's very few exceptions to this and it's, and it's really hit or miss. Like um, one of the foods that has the highest percentage of their protein is branched chain amino acids are cranberries also carrots, they're up at like 24%. So um, if you could somehow make uh, like cranberry protein isolate, it would be like the highest branch chain amino acid food in the world. But of course, we get very little of our protein from cranberries and carrots. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of a moot point, but it's interesting. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason um, to which things have high branch chain amino acids as a percent of their protein. So you can pretty much just go with the amount of protein as an indicator. Um, and so you can see, so first off, uh, jello is very low because it is made of gelatin and gelatin is of course, one of the few proteins that is low in, in BCAAs, uh, sour cream and cream cheese are just, they've had most of the protein removed. They're mostly fat and therefore they're low in branch chain amino acids. The same thing with bacon, right? Bacon just doesn't have bacon out of the package is almost all the calories are from fat. So it's low, but the same thing is true of a lot of these things like corned beef hash and kielbasa are mostly fat. And so, uh, if, if you absolutely have to have some meat, uh, flavor in your diet, you could use a little bit of, you know, if you put some corned beef hash on one of those, um, cassava tortillas, right. You'd, you'd probably be okay. Uh, keeping your branch chain amino acids down in general, uh, chicken skin is of course, a lot of connective tissue and a lot of collagen. And that means gelatin. And so it's, it's a little bit lower in branch chain amino acids than some. Um, and then you look at vegetable sources and they're higher. Soy milk is 3.1%. Um, egg yolk is 4%. So that's, you know, uh, kind of borderline, but, um, peas, split peas, black beans are getting up in the fours. I have gelatin on the low side because of course, Gelatin is 100% of its calories as protein, and yet it's only 6.8, whereas, you know, black beans 
maybe 60% of their proteins is from starch and the, the protein that's left is still providing four and a half percent of calories as branch chain amino acids, right? This is not as protein. This is as branch chain amino acids. The highest things are actually egg whites, uh, 19% of calories as branch chain amino acids, haddock, white fish is very, you know, it's, it's very lean. So a very small percentage of the calories are coming from fat. Um, the, the calories in haddock are mostly from protein and therefore it's very high in branching amino acids as a soy protein isolate as is uh, chicken breast is pretty high and you can see there's a lot of intermediate things um there's some funny ones you wouldn't think like asparagus is 6.3 percent branch chain amino acids as calories but of course you're not going to get any significant percentage of your calories from asparagus so you shouldn't worry about it Okay, so the ideas in this video are we have a torpid metabolism. We're trying to get out of it. What do the animals do over their long hibernation period to get ready to emerge? And one of the things we can do to mimic that is to reduce our protein consumption. The bears are not eating protein in the winter. If you reduce your protein consumption dramatically, that seems to go some way to allow you to start to burn that stored fat just like the bears do over the winter. Um, doing this will also reduce uh, tryptophan and therefore kinurinine and therefore era hydrocarbon receptor signaling. And lastly, you can also use a supplement called alpha ketoglutarate or AKG to reduce your branch chain amino acids. I've been having good luck with it. You can see that it's very thermogenic. It will increase your body temperature. And I sell that at fireinabottle.net slash shop. And if you want to get some, it really helps me make these videos. And the second part of this diet is you need to resaturate. And the only tool that I know of that you can use to super easily do this are the medium long chain saturated fats, lauric and myristic acid. Those two fats, if you eat enough of them, they will absolutely become incorporated into your body fat and they will steadily replace monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. And so that's why I think they might be really important and I suspect they will continue to work better and better over time as you continue to eat them and your body can continue to replace uh, the MUFA with it. Um, and those come from coconut and palm kernel oil are the only two really good sources of them. You can see that it says palm kernel oil. Uh, butter is another source or dairy fats are another source, but it's not very high. It's only a, a few percent as opposed to the coconut and palm kernel are more like 60 or 70 percent. And again, I just want to emphasize not palm oil, palm kernel oil. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I'm very excited about the concepts in this video. Uh, I think it's only up from here. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to try this. Let me know your experiences. Let me know how you're doing in the comments below, and I will see you next time.